KC and the Astro. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm here to remind you that words, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the stations airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So I've got three new movies to review for you for this show, about uh, two, or rather, yeah, two less than I would ideally like to have, but three was, was the most I could see on this busy weekend, what more can I tell you? But I do have a lot of significant movies to review. First, though, I'm going to get in my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office, the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And I wanted a movie to debut at number one that would absolutely crush Tyler Perry's Boo 2 of Medea Halloween, crush it like the Hulk. Fortunately, Thor Ragnarok did that and nabbed the number one spot, as predicted, immediately. Thor Ragnarok debuted on November 3rd, which was this past Friday, and it grossed a very impressive $22.7 million in the United States and $439.5 million worldwide against a budget of $180 million. So although Thor Ragnarok is not a hit yet, it will probably at least be a tentative hit by next weekend. It's off to a tremendous start, especially given its budget. But internationally already, Thor Ragnarok is a certified hit. And my anticipation is that, or my prediction is that, Thor Ragnarok will be a certified hit in at least two weeks here in the United States. But of course, we'll have to see. Another movie that's off to a great start is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, which also is the number two movie of the week, which is A Bad Mom's Christmas, which is, of course, a sequel to the 2015 movie that I hated. But A Bad Mom's Christmas debuted with $16.8 million at the weekend box office, and that is against a budget of $28 million. But... Total, it has grossed $21.3 million. Again, that $16.8 million is the weekend box office because A Bad Mom's Christmas debuted on Wednesday, November 1st and actually did pretty well for itself. Internationally, it has grossed $28.2 million, which means it is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, it is a tentative hit. And it looks like it's on its way to being a certified hit, love it or hate it. And I'll let you know what I think about that movie later on in the show. Jigsaw was number one at the box office last week. This week, it's still held strong, given that it's not Halloween anymore, but it was number three this past weekend, dropping from number one last week. This weekend, it earned $6.6 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $10 million, Jigsaw has so far grossed $28.7 million here in the States and $59.5 million worldwide. So... Whether or not you're sick of the Saw movies or not, and whether or not you didn't like, whether or not you liked the movie Jigsaw, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, definitely having a hot streak amongst other horror movies of 2017. Number four at the box office this weekend, in its third week in release, is a movie that should probably be out of the top ten right now, not only because it sucks, but also because it is not Halloween anymore. And that movie is Tyler Perry's Boo 2 of Medea Halloween, which grossed $4.5 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $25 million, Tyler Perry's Boo 2 of Medea Halloween grossed $42.8 million here in the States so far, and... 43.3 million around the world, meaning that it is a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. It may become certified by next week or maybe the week after that. Let's hope it doesn't, but chances are it probably will be. 
Geostorm is a movie that's still in the top five, not just in the top ten, but it is struggling mightily. And chances are, at least in the United States, Geostorm looks like it is going to be a bomb. Geostorm is number five at the box office this weekend, having never grossed more than Boo 2 and Medea Halloween. But then again, I've seen Boo 2 and I haven't seen Geostorm, and I'm not really interested in seeing Geostorm either, and apparently not a lot of other people are either. But Geostorm grossed $3.2 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $120 million, Geostorm has only grossed $28.9 million here in the States, but it has grossed $182.4 million worldwide, which means it's not a hit here in the U.S. and probably won't be, but around the world it is a tentative hit. Happy Death Day. I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, it is a certified hit. It only grossed $2.7 million this past weekend, giving it the number six spot. But against a budget of $4.8 million, Happy Death Day has so far grossed $52.9 million here in the States and $78.4 million worldwide. Blade Runner 2049 is number seven at the box office, also struggling a little bit, but not as much as Geostorm, having grossed $2.3 million at the U.S. box office in its fifth week in release. Against a budget of $150 million, Blade Runner 2049 has so far grossed $85.5 million here in the States and $240.6 million worldwide, meaning that it's not a hit yet here in the in the states but around the world it's a tentative hit and this is a movie that deserves to be a certified hit in both instances but what can you do thank you for your service was number six in the box office last week this week is number eight having grossed 2.2 million dollars in its second week in release against a budget of 20 million dollars thank you for your services so far grossed 7.3 million dollars in the u.s i don't have any information for how it did worldwide but here in the u.s it is not a hit yet only the Brave is another movie that also stars Miles Teller, is also based on a true story about American heroes, and is also struggling at the box office. This week at number nine, it grossed $1.9 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $38 million, Only the Brave has only grossed $15.3 million in the U.S. I don't have any information on how it's doing worldwide, but here in the States, it is not a hit yet. And at number nine, it looks like it may never be. Let There Be Light is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number 10 at the box office, and as you can tell from the title, it is a religious movie. It grossed $1.7 million this week. Against a budget of $3 million, it has so far grossed $4.1 million in the U.S. I don't have any information for how it's doing globally, but here in the U.S., it is most cer certainly a tentative hit. Okay, Sarah, I'm dropping you at Emily's, and Josh, you're going to soccer, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, and by the way, when I pick you up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, me and my short shorts doing my daddy dance. Your friends will love it. No! Well, I might change my mind if you buckle your seatbelts. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Whatever it takes, keep them safe. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. Making Waves with Boston's All-Italian Language Program, featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui su bostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana di ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television, or a community TV station that was nice enough to pick up this broadcast, and then I say thank you, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Thor Ragnarok. This is the third Thor movie, and it is also the 17th 
Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, if you can believe it. Yes, there have been 17 Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, and Thor Ragnarok shows that the Marvel Cinematic Universe shows no signs of slowing down, especially into a movie that will most certainly be a hit next year, which is The Avengers Infinity War. But before that Infinity War goes on, Thor, who is imprisoned, finds himself in a lethal gladiatorial contest against the Hulk, his former ally. Thor must fight for survival and race against time to prevent the all-powerful Hela, who is his sister, from destroying his home, with Asgard, and the Asgardian civilization. So, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, you're probably wondering what Ragnarok is. Well, Ragnarok is a term in Norse mythology, which is a series of future events, including a great battle that is foretold to ultimately result in the death of a number of major figures, including the gods Odin, Thor, Tyr, Freyr, Hemdalr, <laughs> however you pronounce that, and Loki. So th this apocalypse against the the Norse city of Asgardian, excuse me, Asgard, is the main premise behind this third Thor movie. And this also explains where Thor and the Incredible Hulk were when Captain America and Iron Man were having their civil war in the movie Captain America Civil War. In fact, I was wondering that myself when I was watching that movie last year. And as great as that movie was and how it narrowly missed being in my top 10, I was wondering where is Thor and where is the Incredible Hulk? Well, this movie explains exactly where they are. And this, this movie is, amongst the people who have seen the first two Thor movies, is actually considered the best Thor movie. And even though I have not seen the first two Thor movies, I have to agree with people that there must be something very special about this movie because I was left giddy as I was watching this film. It was great to see Chris Hemsworth reprise his role of Thor. There is an explanation for the haircut you might see on the movie posters. And there are various cameos in this film, not to mention the appearance of Bruce Banner slash the Hulk himself, reprised here by Mark Ruffalo, that will not leave fans disappointed. But the movie starts off with Chris Hemsworth as Thor actually being kidnapped by a, <laughs> a Norse demon by the name of Surtur, who's played in this movie by Clancy Brown. And Surtur is prophesizing to Thor about the oncoming Ragnarok, which is the Norse apocalypse of his home city. But Thor escapes Sortur, and that's not spoiling anything, and visits his home of Asgard, where he finds his father Odin, who's played by Anthony Hopkins, and his brother, who he thought was dead, Loki, who is reprised in this movie by Tom Hiddleston. And this time, Loki and Thor are actually not at war. They're allies only because Odin dies and unknowingly releases his oldest daughter, Hela, played by Camp Bl Kate Blanchett, from captivity. And Hela wastes no time in taking over Asgard and also banishing both Loki and Thor from their home city. But eventually, Thor and Loki find themselves in another city, which is ruled by another intergalactic area which is ruled by actually probably one of the interesting casting choices uh, Jeff Goldblum playing the role of Grandmaster and a lot of people have said some really good things about Jeff Goldblum I was not particularly fond of his role in this movie but for what what I think Jeff Goldblum lacked every other character in this movie every other actor made up for I especially loved a lot of the newer characters, like Hemdall, who's played by Idris Elba in this film. I also absolutely loved v 
Valkyrie, who's played in this movie by Tessa Thompson. And Tessa Thompson is an actress I've loved ever since seeing her three years ago in the movie Dear White People. And she's been solid in just about every movie I've seen her in from... Well, I, I, I can't exactly name all the films she's been in, but what's interesting about casting Tessa Thompson in the role of Valkyrie is in the Thor comic books, Valkyrie is a blonde white woman, whereas obviously Tessa Thompson is neither blonde nor white, but even still, I thought any anyone who is particularly stringent on the comic book regulations will not mind Tessa Thompson, and in fact, we'll, we'll love her in this role. I know I certainly did. So I really can't spoil a lot of Thor Ragnarok. What I can say, though, is that, as I said previously, Thor Ragnarok is a great sign that the Marvel Cinematic Universe, after nine years and 17 movies, is not slowing down. And that is incredible, especially considering that the Avengers are going to have their third movie next summer. I can't say whether or not th that movie is going to be great or not. Hopefully it is. It shows a lot of signs of being great. But what I liked, in addition to Thor Ragnarok leading up to Avengers Infinity War, was that it wasn't just a preview. I thought it had a lot of plots and subplots in this film that tied in together to make overall a great film, which earns my rating of a knockout. It is exciting. It literally had me on the edge of my seat jumping up and down. And if you haven't seen it yet, see it. Listen, my life changed because someone was there to get me to use drugs. No one can understand. People think that having someone who will listen makes it better. I need help. I'm listening. I need help. I think that having someone who will listen makes it better. People understand. No one can get me to use drugs. My life changed because someone was there to listen. Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to turn addiction around. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Handsome Dick Manitoba, and you are listening to the Joe Gay. Pop explosion. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way, I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on BostonFreeRadio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is a movie I was not quite as enthusiastic about going to as I was about Thor Ragnarok, and that movie is A Bad Mom's Christmas. However, I do have to say that I liked A Bad Mom's Christmas better than I thought I would, and also much better than last year's Bad Moms, which I thought tried way too hard to be Bridesmaids or The Hangover. And there are moments where a Bad Moms Christmas tries way too hard to be that edgy R-rated comedy. It is an R-rated comedy. Is it edgy? In parts, but I think that if this movie really wanted to be edgy, it would have helped if the movie wasn't written by men like the last movie was. And it also might have helped if the actors and maybe even the script weren't trying so hard. But there were moments of this movie where I was actually pleasantly surprised that it was funny. So anyway, A Bad Mom's Christmas follows our three underappreciated and overburdened moms who are Amy, played by Mila Kunis, Kiki, played by Kristen Bell, and Carla, played by Katherine Hahn, all of whom were really good in the, the first Bad Moms movie, and they are good in this movie. They were probably the only likable, relatable characters in either movie. Every other character in this film, I just wanted to punch in the face. But anyway... These women rebel against the challenges and expectations of the Super Bowl for moms, which is Christmas. And they, what really lights a fire under their rebellion is the fact that each of these three women actually have 
their own moms come visit them for the holidays. So Amy's mom, Mila Kunis's character, has the overbearing, micromanaging, manipulative Ruth as a mother, who's played in this movie by Christine Baranski. I'm not sure if the casting choice is the greatest here, considering that Mila Kunis is Ukrainian and Christine Baranski is a wasp. But either way, if you want somebody who's an overbearing, manipulative wasp, Christine Baranski fits that to a T. She usually plays that in almost all of her movie roles, except maybe Adam's Family Values and The, the Good Wife. But moving on. Kristen Bell's mother in this movie is Sandy, played by Cheryl Hines, who is very clingy and very, very creepy. And I thought that Cheryl Hines w was so cartoonish and so over the top that I actually, if, if she was my mother, she'd drive me absolutely bonkers. But I got probably a lot more laughs from her than I did from any other character in this film. But that being said, the woman who plays Catherine Hahn's character's mom, whose name is Isis, and yes, that is her real name, is Susan Sarandon, who is, uh, I think, lately having almost a new path to her career for herself playing the cool grandma. And I think she, she actually does really well in the sense that of the three moms of the bad moms, Susan Sarandon is undoubtedly the coolest. So I thought that Susan Sarandon, in addition to Cheryl Hines, had some great scenes. And I actually thought the best scenes in this film were when Susan Sarandon, Cheryl Hines, and Christine Baranski got together to relate to one another. And I, I just, th there were some funny moments, other moments that were poignant. And I think the, the movie didn't work quite as well when it tried to be raunchy. I think this movie still could have been edgy and still could have been funny if they had probably cut out a lot of the swear words of this film because the swears that were put into this film which the characters spoke all sounded contrived whether it was from an older woman like Christine Baranski or from a younger girl like the actress who plays Mila Kunis's stepdaughter in this movie where she says where she repeats something that she heard her stepmom say when she and her father were having sex oh my <clears throat> god and I'm not going to say the word, even though Boston Free Radio allows me to say swear words. I like to keep my commentary PG. So, as I said, Mila Kunis, Kristen Bell, Katherine Hahn, great actresses in their own way in this film. I thought they, they, they certainly made the film worth watching. But I would love to see a sequel with... Christine Baranski, Cheryl Hines, and Susan Sarandon. In fact, I, I'm not going to tell you exactly how the movie ends, but the movie does hint that there might be a sequel going on. And if it's the three of them getting out of that hellish suburb in which the movie takes place where I really want to take one of the kids and just... <laughs> just torpedo them over my head and just hit every other character and just knock them down. If these people just got out of that, that hellish suburb and created their own movie, I'd love to see how that movie turned out. But I thought the movie had moments of poignancy. It did get a little predictable, especially where Pr Christine Baranski's character is micromanaging the Christmas decorations and against... Mila Kunis's character's wishes has this elaborate, stiff Christmas Eve party where Kenny G is playing. I, I thought that was a little too predictable. I thought the fallout between the two characters was also very predictable. And also, the kids in the movie, particularly the, the two children who play Mila Kunis's children, uh, Jane, played by Una Lawrence, and Dylan, who's played by MJ Anthony, I didn't like them. And it's not that I didn't like the actors who played them, but for a movie that's about moms, I would have expected other characters besides the moms and the grandmas to be fully fleshed out characters. But there were moments where I wanted to slap both of Mila Kunis's kids' characters in the face. I, it was just... There was one scene in particular where... Christine Baranski and Mila Kunis have the inevitable fallout, and then 
the the two kids say to their mom, you're just going to kick grandma out the same way you kicked dad out. And I actually said in the theater something I will not repeat here on the air because, again, PG-rated language for the commentary. But... Other than that, Bad Moms, while it was predictable, did have some laughs, and I give it my rating of a marginal checkout. It did actually succeed in being better than the original Bad Moms, and if you haven't seen Bad Moms, you won't be lost when you see a Bad Moms Christmas. In fact, you might be a little bit charmed. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Boston Free Radio has no corporate agenda. We're independent media for the people. Your music, your voice. Your station. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Square. This is the latest from director Ruben Ostland. And if that name sounds Scandinavian, that's because it is. Ruben Ostland is a native of Sweden, and he has directed such international films, or Swedish films, I should say, as Play from 2011, Involuntary from 2008, and Force Majeure, also known as Tourist, from 2014. So full disclosure, I have never seen any of Mr. Ostland's previous films, but from seeing The Square, he is, to me, an auteur of various talents and tastes, and he is particularly an acquired taste because The Square is a very, very random movie and it won't be to everyone's taste. This movie actually has gotten really, really good reviews from such esteemed critics as A.O. Scott and Peter Travers, both of whom I admire very much. It also won the prestige, prestigious Palme d'Or Award at the Cannes Film Festival this past year, and it is a poignant satirical drama reflecting our times, or at least according to the description that's given to me on IMDb, about the sense of community, moral color, moral courage, and the affluent person's need for egocentricity in an increasingly uncertain world. That is a very broad scope for what this movie is, but The Square is very much like a modern art piece. It's a move it's a movie that is certainly very eccentric. It's very elaborate. It certainly makes you think, but not everybody who watches this movie is going to get a lot out of it. And as for me, I thought the movie was overlong, but I did think it had very good performances and amazing cinematography. So I'll give it credit for that. The main character of this movie is somebody named Christian, who is a Swedish man played by Klaes Bang. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. His first name is, is spelled C-L-A-E-S, so I'm going to say Klaes. That, that seems to be the most logical thing for me. So Christian, the character played by Klaes Banks, is an art exhibitor who is in charge of a, well, a curator of an art museum in Stockholm, Sweden. And he is particularly in charge of a new exhibit in the front of this art museum, which is actually just a square in the ground. 
And the movie actually has a very good montage of a statue of some sort of war hero in Stockholm that's actually being taken down to make room for what's essentially a flat space on the ground. So there's a little bit of irony there that I liked. And one of the most fascinating sequences in this film is that montage, particularly when there's a crane that's lifting this statue of a soldier who looks a lot like Napoleon, who wears the same kind of hat and is riding a horse. This crane is lifting that statue off its podium, and you see the, the crane lifted up, and then you see the statue break and fall down as the crane's lifting it up. But the construction workers around there around the statue don't even bat an eyelash when it falls down and breaks, which gives you an idea of what the, the people in this museum probably think or don't think about their Swedish history. So I thought that was a, a pretty good subtle piece of satire right there. Cause I gotta tell you, if that ever happened to me, if I was working in construction and I ruined a historical statue, I would be crushed. I would probably be bawling my eyes out. That doesn't happen in this movie, which I thought was brilliant. And also, they remove this historical statue, as I said, to make room on this ground for what is essentially a blank piece of pavement. It doesn't have any writing on it. It does have lights that illuminate it, but other than those lights, there's really nothing else about that square that separates it from the rest of the pavement. So I, I guess that could be a parody of modern art seeming to be something that's maybe just something somebody threw on a piece of canvas and maybe to a layman's eyes probably didn't put a lot of thought into. But the, the, this particular square generates some controversy when some ambitious filmmakers who work for this art museum create a controversial viral video involving a small child who is homeless dying in the square. And the tagline that goes with this viral video certainly doesn't fit the image that you see. So did I think that was hilarious to see? No, I didn't. I was, I was shocked and mortified. But that's where satire really works in this film because it, it shows you that it's, it, satire is not necessarily funny, but it, it is certainly an exaggeration of things that occur in life. And, it, and satire always makes you think. So I thought that that movie, that, that part of the movie demonstrated that perfectly. I also was really drawn to a sequence involving a stunt actor named Terry no Notary, who plays a character named Oleg in this film, who is basically a guy who, for artistic purposes, goes around acting like a monkey. And I'm, I'm not even kidding. He acts like this big, irate gorilla. And he does so in this in probably the most iconic scene in this film, where in a very unedited camera shot, he goes from entertaining these high-end guests of the art, hotel, uh, art exhibit and eventually makes them feel more and more uncomfortable. And I thought the body language of these spectators as this guy is going from being entertaining to being confrontational was brilliant about this film. And this is a movie that I didn't especially love when I saw it. In fact, as the movie was reaching the two hour and 20 minute mark, I was wondering to myself, when is this going to end? But as I was thinking more and more about it, I thought the aforementioned scenes were somewhat brilliant. And I did like the dynamic of the character Christian being disconnected to people, including maybe the woman to whom he's making love and his own daughters who basically ignore him. So I thought it was overlong. I didn't think a lot of the non sequiturs really hit the mark, but I give this movie a checkout.
Is that a faucet running? That's not a faucet. That's a river rushing through the forest. Forest rivers provide over 100 million people with clean water to drink. What? I can't hear you because of the vacuum. That's not a vacuum. That's the trees in the forest cleaning up the air we breathe. I didn't know the trees were so amazing. Yep, and the forest gives us shade, trees to climb. That's awesome. Let's go explore some more. Visit the forest today and enjoy all it does just for you. To learn more about the forest and find one near you, go to discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I have reviewed all the films that I'm going to review for this show, that I have to review. I, I try to see at least three movies a week, but unfortunately, I would ideally like to see five. But with that said, I'm just going to dedicate this next segment of Words on Film on movie news. And apparently there is a lot of movie news, particularly involving Kevin Spacey. So I haven't discussed a lot of the controversy surrounding the sexual assault and sexual abuse allegations of Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey on the show, mainly because I've had a lot of movies to review for this show. And also, unless I have absolutely nothing to talk about, I don't regard this as a movie news show but maybe i should better incorporate movie news into the show because there is actually a lot of movie news about kevin spacey right now and particularly his sexual abuse allegations which is really costing him his career and i really don't have any opinion about what kevin spacey did or didn't do if these sexual abuse allegations are true which i think they are then i do think that kevin spacey deserves his career plummet, and I don't say that about a lot of people, but particularly regarding his career plummet, he has a movie coming out called All the Money in the World, and this is a movie that stars him, Kevin Spacey, and Michelle Williams, about other people, and it is the true story about the kidnapping of 16-year-old John Paul Getty III and the desperate attempt by his devoted mother to convince his billionaire grandfather to pay the ransom. So, like most Kevin Spacey movies, All the Money in the World sounds like a very intriguing film. And it's not that it's being pulled from full distribution, but according to Variety, uh, it has been yanked from the upcoming AFI Film Festival. And the, the reason that it's being yanked is because of the sexual harassment and assault allegations against star Kevin Spacey. So Variety reported on Monday that the studio was considering yanking the picture from the gathering as well as the as weighing opening the movie in 2018, which I think might be a good move, but the studio said that the release date will remain unchanged. It will premiere in wide release on December 22, 2017, but it just won't be in the AFI Film Festival, which I can't say for sure whether or not that will hurt the film, but Kevin Spacey's reputation right now and the fact that he's, he's been dropped from the, the show he's doing on Netflix, House of Cards, is certainly... Uh, probably a good move. As a matter of fact, another story about Kevin Spacey here, which I find very intriguing, is that according to IndieWire, there is a House of Cards petition on, I think it's change.org, 
to replace Kevin Spacey with Kevin James. Let me say that again. There is a petition on change.org to replace the actor from The Usual Suspects in American Beauty with the actor from Paul Blart Mall Cop on House of Cards. That is a crazy idea, but it's so crazy that it just might work. So this petition, which launched on change.org, is addressed to Netflix co-founder and CEO Reed Hastings and somehow already has over 28,000 signatures as of right now, as of November 17th, 2017, at 1.40 p.m. <laughs> I would not actually be opposed to seeing that. I mean, Kevin James is... A, well, he might not be the right role because he's a likable guy. Don't, never mind his his acting skills. I actually think, despite the bad movies he's been in, like both Paul Blart movies, I think he's actually a good actor. Will he be as cold as Kevin Spacey is good at being? He might. I, I wouldn't underestimate Kevin um, James, but again, I don't know whether or not Netflix will actually consider this. Another piece of movie news, while I get off the subject of Kevin Spacey and Kevin James, is that there is a Shazam movie that's coming out. Shazam is a comic book character, I think, in the DC universe. He was really big in the 60s, but since then, Shazam has been a punchline, I, I think, because Shazam is just a, another Superman character that wears, admittedly, a more interesting uniform, but other than that, I don't know anything about Shazam. All I know is that it is a character in comic books that was, I think, resurrected recently. But apparently, according to The Hollywood Reporter, there is going to be a Shazam movie, which is not out of place considering the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Justice League movies, but Shazam is actually finding it's Billy Batson, who, who I guess is the alter ego character, with a character from a Disney Channel movie called Andy, uh, excuse me, a Disney Channel TV show called Andy Mack. The actor is um, Asher Angel. I, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Angel, Angel, I'm not sure. But he's playing opposite, Billy Batson opposite Zachary Levy in New Line's DC superhero movie, Shazam, which I don't know if Shazam is going to be part of the Justice League. I, I, probably not, because the Justice League movie comes out a week from Friday, so I think Shazam is a little too late for that party, but he might actually lighten, liven up the uh, Justice League movie if they were to include him in there, but that that is uh, the, the scoop so far about the movie Shazam. And the movie is in pre-production right now. It's going to start production in early 2018, which means that we probably won't see the Shazam movie until maybe winter of 2019 at the earliest. But I'd be interested to see what Shazam is like. It's probably going to be a lighthearted movie, but again, of course, we'll have to see. But there is another movie called The True History of the Kelly Gang, which stars Russell Crowe and Nicholas Holt, which is also a pre-production. But the news, according to The Hollywood Reporter from a day ago, is that Russell Crowe and Nicholas Holt are set to star in this movie. And the movie also stars Captain Fantastic actor George McKay and Essie Davis, who made her debut in the... The, the movie The Babadook. And this movie is, is a true history? I don't know, but it is a gothic western, which is based on Peter Carey's Booker, Booker Prize winning novel of the same name. Yeah, so it's based on a novel. Ooh. When is the best time to talk to your family about staying in touch during a disaster? When floodwaters reach your door? When wildfires are engulfing the edge of your neighborhood? Or an earthquake is destroying buildings? Or is the best time, perhaps, today? During a disaster, you may not be able to stay in touch with your family or friends as easily as you think. Go to ready.gov communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. I love the real six sides. They're the ones that move. Thinly blow, <laughs> neurotic toe. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've pretty much run out of movie news and movie reviews to talk about, I'm now going to get early into my next segment, which is what's coming out next. This is a verbal preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And maybe if I have time, I'll get into the movies that are coming out next weekend, but I will try to stick with the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And even though the Justice League movie is coming out a week from Friday, and I am interested in seeing that, but not necessarily excited, I'm going to get into the movies that are coming out this weekend, the weekend of November 10th through 12th. The biggest movie that's coming out this weekend, which will most certainly be playing in the theater near you, is Murder on the Orient Express. This is a remake based on the best-selling novel by the late, great Agatha Christie. Now, I haven't read any of Agatha Christie's books, but... I certainly know her by reputation, and Murder on the Orient Express is about a lavish train ride that unfolds into a stylish and suspenseful mystery. From the novel, as I said, by Agatha Christie, Murder on the, Murder on the Orient Express tells the story of 13 stranded strangers, including Poirot, who's played by Kenneth Branagh, who also directs this film, and one man's race probably Poirot, to solve the puzzle before the murderer strikes again. So very much like the Murder on the Orient Express movie that came out in the 60s, this Murder on the Orient Express movie has an all-star cast, including Kenneth Branagh, Leslie Odom Jr., Daisy Ridley from the newest Star Wars films, Johnny Depp, Judi Dench, Penelope Cruz, and others. There's a whole roster of actors that are going to be in this film and i can't wait actually to see what it's like i'm going to ignore early reviews of this film but this is a movie i definitely will see and even though i'm going to be actually at a comic book convention this coming weekend i will definitely make it a point to go out to the theaters and see as many movies as i can hopefully five by the time i come back to do this show and when i review this movie i will let you know what i think on next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters is the somewhat highly anticipated Daddy's Home 2. This is a sequel to the movie starring Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg, where Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg reprise their roles. And, of course, Daddy's Home is the movie that came out in during the holiday season two years ago. And I didn't expect much from the movie, but it actually was funnier than I thought it would be. Both Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg played off pretty well against each other, playing the, the types that certainly fit to their strengths. Will Ferrell playing a well-meaning but still funny guy, and Mark Wahlberg playing the tough guy he usually plays. So. This time, Brad and Dusty must deal with their intrusive fathers during the holiday. So, again, as I said, Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell reprise their roles, but this time, Will Ferrell's father comes to visit, and he's played by John Lithgow, very good casting choice, and Mark Wahlberg's father is played by Mel Gibson, which is an interesting casting choice. We'll see whether or not it's a good or bad choice because Mel Gibson has still been steadily acting even though he's fallen from his A-list status. Time will tell whether or not he will, rec will fully redeem himself, but he certainly redeemed himself as a director from last year's decent movie Hacksaw Ridge, which I gave my rating of knockout, and I'd probably... I mean, I'd give that I'd, I'd probably stick with that rating, but in terms of Mel Gibson's acting, I've seen him act well in certain movies from from um, well, I, I think I, I can't I can't think of it the the titles of the movies right now, but moving on, Daddy's Home Two should certainly be interesting. Hopefully, it would be funnier than A Bad Mom's Christmas, which actually, as you probably remember from my review earlier, I didn't think was altogether a bad movie. But Daddy's Home Two has the potential to be funnier. But we'll see if it is when I do my show this coming Tuesday. 
So the other movies that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend are movies that are in limited release. There are some that I know are going to be coming out in theaters near me, and some I'm not sure. One of the movies I'm almost positive is coming out near me is an independent film called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. This is a darkly comic drama about a mother personally challenging the local authorities to solve her daughter's murder when they fail to catch the culprit. And this movie is also literally about three billboards that are outside this town of Ebbing, Missouri. And this mother is played by Frances McDormand. And the movie also stars... Woody Harrelson, Sam Rockwell, and Caleb Landry. And even though it sounds like a movie that the Coen brothers might have written or directed, it's actually directed by Martin McDonough, who also wrote the screenplay. Probably undoubtedly inspired by the Coen brothers, but Martin McDonough is a British writer and director who also has brought us, in terms of just directing... He has brought us Seven Psychopaths from 2012, which I saw advertised in theaters, but I didn't actually see it when it came out. And he also directed In Bruges, which was Colin Farrell's comeback movie. He was also nominated in 2005 for the short film... Oh, he actually won an Oscar for the short film Six Shooter, which came out in 2006. I've got to actually look up that film if, if hopefully it's posted on, on YouTube or some easy site where I can view those short films. But again, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri looks very interesting, not only on, in terms of the premise, but also the cast. I don't think I've ever seen Frances, Frances McDormand in a bad film, or if I've seen her in a bad film, she certainly hasn't acted badly in it. So, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri is a movie I probably will see if it's coming out in a theater near me, and if it is, I will see it, and I will let you know what I think next week. So I only have about 30 seconds before the next break, but I'll give you my synopsis of another limited movie that's coming out in theaters, and it's called Thelma. It's a movie about a woman who begins to fall in love, only, discover, only to discover that she has fantastic powers. This is not a superhero movie, as far as I can tell, but it is a drama, mystery, romance thriller, according to IMDb, that is directed by Joshim Trier. But, and Joachim Trier is a Dutch or Danish director. He's from Denmark. When it comes to saving money, don't act like a baby. Goo goo gaga. Be the boss and make a budget. I'm the boss, baby. You're not the boss of me. I am the boss of you. I'm not. M2. I'm not. M2. <sighs> Need a little help? Aren't you going to do any work? I'm very busy delegating. Create a personalized savings plan. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. And get other tools and tips at feedthepig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and continuing with my segment, What's Coming Out Next? I was briefly discussing before the break the movie Thelma, which is a Danish film. People from Denmark are Danish. People are from the Netherlands are Dutch. I'm pretty sure I have that right. It stars Ellie Harbo, Kayla Wilkins, Henrik Rafelson, and Ellen Dorrit Peterson. So a number of other Danish actors. So if this is a movie that doesn't suit your fancy, I'll see it if it's coming out in the theater near me, and I'll let you know whether or not it's worth watching. But there is another movie that is coming out with American actors, which you might be interested in, that's also coming out in limited release. The movie is called Amanda and Jack Go Glamping. G-L-A-M-P-I-N-G. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but here's the synopsis. 
With his marriage and career against the ropes, dejected author Jack Spencer travels with his wife Amanda to an isolated glamping retreat in search of a spark. Again, glamping, I don't know what that is. When a surprise double booking finds their private retreat anything but private, Jack spins into a comedic exploration of love, lost dreams, small town wisdom, and friendship with a miniature donkey random to get over himself before he loses all he holds dear so the movie stars amy acker adam canto david arquette who i believe plays the jack spencer role and june squibb so you got a pretty interesting cast there amy acker is a actress i'm vaguely familiar with she certainly is very pretty uh she's been in movies like or she's been in tv shows like per- persons of interest and angel and she's been in movies like The Cabin in the Woods and the 2012 um, J- John Favreau, excuse me, Josh Whedon directed Much Ado About Nothing, which Josh Whedon directed after he did the first Avengers movie. And this is a movie that certainly looks interesting, if only because I don't know what glamping is. And if anybody who is watching this on Facebook Live wants to tell me what glamping is, please leave a comment because I have no idea. I, I think glamping kind of sounds like camping, but I don't know what the GL stands for. Maybe gardening, I, I, I gardening, lounging, I don't know. But it's an interesting play on words. And if it's coming out in a theater near me, I'll try to seek it out, and I'll let you know what I think when I do my show next week. But there's another movie that's coming out that is a re-release of a movie from 1965. Oh, actually, I've got a definition of glamping right here. Thank you, Joe Forrestel. Glamping is glamorous camping. So I guess that means folks that bring all the first world amenities to the wilderness and call themselves outdoorsy. Kind of sounds like my Boy Scout troop, but (laughs) anyway, that's what glamping is. Thank you, Joe, for that. There's another movie that's coming out called Shakespeare Walla that actually came out in 1965, and it's being re-released for its 52nd reunion. Or anniversary, I should say. It's the story of a family troupe of English actors in India. And they travel around the towns and villages giving performances of Shakespearean plays. Through their travels, we see the changing face of India as the old is replaced by the new. Maharajas become hotel owners. Sports become more important than culture. And the theater is replaced by Bollywood movies. It's based on the travels of Jeffrey Kendall with his daughter, Felicity Kendall, who star as themselves in this film. And I gotta tell you, man... This movie, which I haven't seen or heard of, it sounds like one of those films that the Criterion Collection could release and may release after it's done its re-release. It sounds really interesting. Not only the, the Shakespearean aspect of it, but the changing culture of India, particularly when they succeeded in gaining independence from the great from Great Britain. So I'd be interested to see how that movie is. Again, it came out in 1965, so it's by no means a new film or even close to a new film. But, man, it sounds really intriguing. And I am I consider myself a movie buff, but when a movie comes out like this that I haven't heard of, I, I do feel somewhat inadequate in terms of my movie skills but or my movie knowledge, but it did win the National Board of Review's Top 10 Films in 1967, and it won the Silver Berlin Bear Award for Best Actress at the Berlin International Film Festival in 1965. So if that movie's out in theaters, I'll give it a look and I'll let you know what I think on next week's show. But anyway, that just about does it with this edition of Words on Film for November 7th. Thank you so much for tuning in. Just a reminder that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. That's me. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. (laughs) 